So with that, I'd like to begin the opening session. We're going to focus the opening session on, on human uh, embryonic development and human stem cells. We have three really amazing speakers that are going to come, uh, uh, came to talk to you today. The first speaker today will be Magda zernika Ghost. She came from uh, Cambridge University, and she's going to talk about um, the, uh, the role of, of, of the stem cells themselves in controlling aneuploidy and, and development in the very early stages, pre-implantation and then implant, uh, after implantation. With that, I'd like to welcome Magda to the stage. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's really a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I very much hope that I can tell you a few stories that relate to our life, the beginning of our life. And here I would like to start with this uh, painting of Klimt, which is one of my favorite paintings. And it's my favorite painting because this shows the secret of the very beginning of the life of, of all of us. So it shows the, on the left the golden sperm of Zeus, which is showering over Danes eggs, which are shown on the right uh, bottom corner, and making them develop on this blanket into the blastocyst-like structure. And I hope you will be able to recognize them. I can't, unfortunately, point to them. And this is quite incredible that this is more than 100 years ago. Klimt already knew how blastocyst-like stage embryo look like. This is the seven first days of our life. And here's the blastocyst structure, so one of those structures that Klimt show on Dana's blanket, as we see it in the lab. And I think it's absolutely beautiful in its simplicity. So this is really how each of us' life starts, with that structure on the seventh day of our life. And it shows that it has all of the components to initiate the beginning of our development. And today I would like to talk about three secrets of blastocyst life, and so therefore three sort of secrets, um, revealing those secrets um, behind the story of life of, e of each of us. So the first relates to the how cells become different from each other for the very first time in our life. So this will be about self-fate decisions and developmental potency. So this would um, tell you about how these three different types of cells are shown here in the blastocyst. So the yellow cells are the cells which are called epiblast, and they are pluripotent. They are the cells which stem cells are derived from, and they are the cells which will give rise to all of the single cell, all of the cells of our body. And they are surrounded by two types of cells, blue and pink, and they are trophoectoderm and primitive endoderm cells. So they are the cells which will generate placenta and yolk sac, which essentially allow those epiblast cells to give the rise to the body in the body of the mother. So they are essential extra embryonic structures. So uh, understanding really uh, how those cells become different from each other will tell us how we can direct differentiation of cells in vitro. So we first have to understand how we actually do it in vivo, how embryo does this first sulfate decisions. So then I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the plasticity, as when we talked about sulfate and destiny and potential, in mammalian development, we can't avoid to talk about plasticity, as this is one of the most amazing features of our own development. And this tells us how our embryos can repair themselves when something goes wrong. And here, the inspiration for one of the major models we use now in the lab to understand this plasticity came uh, from the human embryo, the human embryo which is now um, a very young boy, eight-year-old boy, who is my son, who I love a lot, and I'll tell you how being pregnant with me led me to develop this particular experimental model to understand how embryo repairs itself and when, it goes, when things go wrong. And finally, I would like to tell you a little bit about things which, until right now, were mystery. And this is really what happens to this blastocyst structure upon implantation. And this is so-called black box of development of any mammalian embryo. So we can't do it, we can't culture those embryos beyond the blastocyst stage, either in the mouse or in the human, because while the first seven days of development can occur in vitro, we now have to put back this blastocyst into the body of the mother for implantation. 
And over the last few years, we just um, put, we put a lot of effort to develop a culture system that allow us now to take those mouse and human embryos beyond the blastocyst stage, outside the body of the mother, let them to develop until the time of gastrulation. And today I would like to share with you the very first images of human embryos developing in culture, outside the body of the mother, until they have a signal how to initiate body formation. So, um, yes, so the first thing is, um, the first part uh, of this talk is about how cells decide their fate. And I would like to start with this first model, which is really a textbook model. And the textbook model tells us that this self-aid decision happened at random. So we have this first few days of our development when a um, fertilized egg, which is totipotent, cleaves into smaller and smaller cells. And then at one point, they reach different position within the embryo, either inside or outside. And those inside cells will be pluripotent and outside cells will differentiate to trophic to them. And later on, there will be two types of inside cells, more on the surface or deeper. And again, they will start to uh, develop different lineages. So in this model, random model of development, this is the position of the cell that determines cell fate. And this position is acquired at random. So this is really the model, because it's a textbook model, and we all, all scientists grew up with this model, including me. In fact, it was first proposed by my own PhD mentor, Tarkovsky, which, um, in through experiments in which he showed incredible plasticity of the embryo and importance of cell position. And we wouldn't have questioned this model if not some of the events that happened in my lab when I was starting it more than 15 years ago and made us, made us look at this model from a slightly different perspective. So, indeed, this is the second model which I would like to introduce and talk a little bit more about today. It's called Early Heterogeneity Model. And this model is proposing that cells start to differ from each other independently of cell position, already at the four cell stage. And those early differences guide cell behavior, guide therefore cell position, that then set up cell fate in a more um, less flexible way. So obviously the question is where does the second model come from? And I will tell you in a second, you know, what was the first hint for us to propose this model. But what I wanted to tell you is that this model, when we first proposed it, it was 11 years ago, was not very popular. In fact, it made me suffer quite a lot because this model really was against the dogma. Uh, it was against of what I believed what was proposed against my PhD mentor was even critical of us for proposing those models. So I suffered quite a lot and in fact made me doubt myself and we thought, oh, maybe this model is actually not correct. <coughs> and for a quite a few years, I didn't talk about that model. We moved on, we moved to the later stages of development, implantation stages of development, until two years ago when the new technology become established that allow us to address this model directly in a molecular way. And we build much stronger case for this model. And this is what I would like to show you today. And you'll be able to judge um, and, and choose between those two models. So where does this model come from? And the first hint that something more complex than just cell position might be happening at the beginning of our life, and here I'm using mouse embryos as a major model system, came from lineage tracing studies, which we did more than 10 years ago. Initially, the time-lapse system was not developed to follow each single cell throughout the first few days of development, so we did it by painting blastomers, starting at the two, four cell stage. And more recently, as you can see here, through time-lapse studies, which are allowing us to continuously track the behavior of cells for three, four days of our life. And what we found out through this tracking of cells in this very precise manner, that some cells at the four cell stage are more inclined, or we say biased, to develop into the future fetus, while other cells are more inclined and bi or biased to develop into extra embryonic structures that will make placenta. So this was entirely unexpected, and for years we couldn't believe that it happened, so we did so much. We, we, we imaged thousands of thousands of cells and followed them in this kind of detailed way. But not only that, what we also found out 
that when we build chimeras, so artificial embryos in the mouse, composed of the same type of cells, if we choose those cells that are truly pluripotent and give rise to the fetus, those embryos do develop to term through the whole pregnancy. But if we make chimeras of those four cell stage blastomers that are inclined to more extra embryonic structures such as placenta, they all fail soon after implantation. So really, these results told us that there is some bias in development that starts at the four cell stage. But the question was, well, what does this really mean in a molecular way? So often people, when they say molecular way, that means heart way. Where does bias come from? So blastomers at that stage, mouse and human, are morphologically indistinguishable. So if they are different, can we identify what these differences are? And this discovery really had to wait until a major um, technological breakthrough and this was development of the way of looking at the activity of all of the genes expressed in all of the cells in individual cells, so on an individual cell level. And here I would like to show you the, the cover of the uh, cell, just last issue of cell that came out just a couple of weeks ago, in which two important papers were published from that perspective. So both of them show that indeed the initiation of this molecular differences starts at the four cell stage. So one of those papers shows that it happens on the level of gene transcription, so on a mRNA level, and I'll talk much more about it because that's a paper from our lab. And the second paper is from Nikos Plachta lab, and it shows uh, those differences on the, um, uh, by me so he measured level of binding of transcription factors to DNA. And again, he showed that they are different the four cell stage and this set up cell fate. Okay, so when this new technology appeared <laughs> two years ago, and allow us to look at gene expression pattern in all of, all of these individual cells, we decided to look at the pattern of gene expression not just at the four cell stage to resolve this huge controversy when and how cells start to differ from each other, but we did it throughout the whole pre-implantation development. And as you can imagine, this really provides enormous resource of the data in the lab, and when we look at the pattern of gene expression in individual cells, in the embryo within these first five days of, of embryo life, we found that the cells group according from which stage of development they are derived, which can be predicted. So this was not that exciting, as it was sort of as expected, but it became much more exciting when we focus on the four cell stage embryo. So here we address the question, can we identify any genes that are expressed differentially at this stage? And if we can, are those genes important for sulfate specification? And here's a graph, which I know is a little bit complex, but nevertheless <laughs> beautiful in its meaning, because it identifies this cloud of genes which are highly differentially expressed at the four cell stage, and they are shown here in red. And what is even more exciting, that when we look at those differential gene expression and try to identify sort of general rules behind those genes which we were getting from this data, we found that many of them are targets for two most important pluripotency transcription factors in mouse and human embryo, SOX2 and OCT4. So they are targets of these two important genes. And here, I would like to single one of them only today, SOX21, is a transcription factor which we took to the next stage. So we decided to focus on SOX21 and check whether this gene indeed is important for sulfate specification. Now, I'm talking here about the mouse embryo, which are very similar to human embryo, but we do not know, of course, whether this specific gene is playing any role in development of the human embryo, but if it is not this one, there will be other genes which might be setting up the system into, um, into, um, to start its life and start the cells, make cells start to differ from each other. So there were many reasons why we decided for SOX21. One of them was that it is one of the highest, highest differential express gene. It was peaking at the four cell stage. It's a target of two important genes, SOX4 and SOX2. It's also the gene which was shown in colon cancer to be responsible for differentiation and also for differentiation of pluripotent cells. 
And I would like to show you an example of three experiments which we can do in the lab to address the function of SOX21. So the first one, we thought we should now vary the level of SOX21 expression in just part of the embryo and ask whether this part, this half of the embryo with low level of SOX21 will give rise preferentially to the lineage which will make placenta, as our hypothesis was suggesting. And indeed, we found that it is the case. So we injected one blastomer at the two-cell stage with interfering RNAs to don't regulate SOX21 expression. We found out the cells now give rise to trophectodem. Then we found out this is because SOX21 represses expression of the major differentiation factor called CDX2. And finally, we found that upstream of it is particular epigenetic modification mediated by enzyme called CARM1, methylotransferase. So when CARM1 is expressed, high level of activity of CARM1 leads to high level of activity of SOX21 and other pluripotency genes to drive the sulfide specification. And this was particularly rewarding for us to find out that this specific enzyme is upstream of SOX21 and other pluripotency factor, as we proposed it and published it in 2007, when we first showed that if we upregulate CARM1 function, we can generate every single cell of the mouse fetus from this cell, which received high dose of CARM1. So this is really the model um, um, of how we now um, look, um, working model of how we look at the, uh, at the sulfate decision in the mouse embryo. So this model proposes that heterogeneity starts at the four cell stage. How exactly it happens is still a very big question for us to address. And this regulates, um, is regulated by the activity of CARM1, which regulates expression of pluripotency genes and differentiation of genes so that part of the embryo have higher level of expression of pluripotency genes such as OCT4 and SOX2 and the other part of the embryo lower levels because it expresses a lower level of uh, SOX21 which prevents differentiation. So in this way we can set up sulfate. So I very much like this model for two reasons. The first it shows um, really uh, how very small differences at the very beginning between the cells at the four cell stage embryo in this case, in the mouse embryo case, can be amplified and drive this complexity of our life. How they can decide cell fate by starting slowly, that starting gently, and finally the trigger is reached in which all of the process is smoothly going on and make this embryo develop into blastocyst structure without any failure. So this is what I wanted to tell you about sulfate specification. But as I've mentioned at the beginning, mouse embryos and human embryos have this amazing capacity, which we often refer to as so-called regulative development. And what does this mean? That there is enormous plasticity to sulfate decisions taken at this stage. So the question here is, what really does plasticity mean? What are their limitations? And this is very important because if we can identify the limitations behind the plasticity, we will know that these are the limitations of embryo self-recovery mechanism and how it is set up during development. And the inspiration for this model came uh, from that specific embryo, human embryo, which is Simon, who is Simon. And this, is, uh, this happened during my pregnancy with Simon. So, this was really several years ago, and what I went through at that time is called chorionic villus, chorionic villus sampling, or CVS. And in this procedure, cells are taken from the placenta to look at the level of, and the potential level of abnormalities in them. And in our case with Simon, we found that placenta that joined us had as many as 30% of all of the cells tested showing the same specific abnormality. It was trisomy of chromosome number two. So these news were not very good. Obviously, it made me thought um, uh, a little bit more about it. What can it mean? So, so many cells are affected, so it means that maybe quite early in the pregnancy, of my pregnancy with Simon, this genetic abnormality appeared. And it made me realize that there is no really a good model system to 
address what happens to those cells that are abnormal if they are in the context of normal cells, so they are side by side within the same embryo. And we knew that here the case was most likely so, that we have abnormal and normal cells, because 60% of the cells in the placenta were normal. So what I decided to do, still being pregnant with Simon, is to set up such a model system in the lab. And of course, this is not just a matter of my own pregnancy, because we know that this embryonic chromosomal instability is a source of low human fecundity, is uh, believed to be one of the major reasons for why uh, success in IVF clinics um, is not um, uh, as high as one would wish to be, is very high, but still the, um, some of the embryos um, show this, um, uh, show difficult difficulties in development, and it's also responsible for human genetic variations. And in fact, what is believed is that majority of the human embryos might show some cells at this early pre-implantation stages that are abnormal. So if it is so, the question is what happens to these abnormal cells? And we had three hypotheses that we wanted to address in the lab. The first one is that the cells are eliminated. So this would be wishful thinking, I, would th I, I thought, but still possible. The second possibility is that those cells become directed to form extra embryonic lineage, placenta, while the normal cells are biased to develop embryonic lineage, epiblast. And this was my favorite hypothesis, and as you will see in a second, I was wrong, but I thought this would be most logical. And finally, the third possibility is that those cells do not sense that they are abnormal and they contribute to the embryo equally. So we decided to test it in the mouse uh, because we can't, of course, experiment on human embryos. So the model, the best model we can come up with to address this specific scenario would be in the mouse embryo. But what we found that mouse embryos do not have many abnormal cells normally. So they're different than, than human embryos. And in fact, you can see here the sort of uh, um, eight cell stage mouse embryo. I cannot point it out and the, with the laser, so I will try to explain it. So you, have, you see eight circles concentric circles that each of them show one single cell and each segment of the structure show one chromosome. And all of those chromosomes are normal, diploid, apart from one because it's a male embryo, so it has only one X chromosome. So to be able to model this, we had to induce anoploidy and we do it experimentally by treating embryos with particular drug called reversin, which essentially does not um, allow spindle assembly checkpoint to function. So we start to have chromosomal uh, missegregations. And you can see here in the on the right, this reversin treated embryo is, um, is showing you that many chromosomes have high level of anoploidy. So to be able to model what happens in mosaic human embryos, we now have to put those cells together, uh, abnormal cells and normal cells, and this is what we have done here. So you see here the red embryos. The red embryos are the one in which we have a lot of abnormal cells because they were treated with reversin, and blue embryos are those embryos in which all of the cells are normal. So we put them together at the eight cell stage, and now we follow development of those structure through pre-implantation stages. And the result was absolutely unbelievable. And it's shown here. So what we found, that those abnormal cells become eliminated by so-called programmed cell death or apoptosis. They undertake self-destruction. And here is an example of that on a movie indicated by Arrow, is the cell which is derived from the red clone, so abnormal cells, that undertakes apoptosis. And it's not only dead, but normal cells, those euploid neighboring cells, get rid of the debris left by abnormal cells. So this way, embryo cleans itself. And this starts from abnormal cells, and those normal cells sort of uh, en engulf those debris. So this starts at the time of implantation, so we see that many, when we quantify it, we see that many of the abnormal cells are removed at the time of implantation, and it continues soon after implantation. In trophoectoderm, though, which gives rise to the placenta, the situation is different. Those cells are tolerated. They are slowly dividing ones. This is the result I'm not showing here, but they are surviving there well. So then we ask the question, what is actually the proportion of normal cells that we need in mouse embryos for embryo to survive all the way through the pregnancy to birth. And we address this question by either doing what we have done, and I've told you already, 
right now, so we took half abnormal, um, half cells were abnormal and half normal, and we found that all of those embryos correct themselves. So none of those embryos really were aborted during the pregnancy, and they were all fine. But even when we took 75% of abnormal cells and combined them with 25% of normal cells, even some of those embryos, not all of them, but around 40% of them developed to birth. And it was only when all of the cells are abnormal, those embryos didn't make it. So <coughs> I think it's absolutely incredible to understand what's the mechanism behind it and understand the capability of our embryos to really correct those things that accidentally might happen during the early stages of its life. Okay, so in the next few minutes, I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, development beyond implantation, so behind this curtain of the blastocyst, which we could never go beyond because the embryos could not be cultured in vitro beyond the blastocyst stage. So we developed such a system, and here we develop it first for the mouse embryo, but today I would like to show you results only for the human embryo, which are not yet published, which come up, uh, which will, come, will be published in Nature and Nature Cell Biology, two papers, next month. So we know um, through pioneering work of Bob Edwards um, in, uh, in actually the same place where I am from, in Cambridge um, University, in physiological laboratory, that we can fertilize human eggs in vitro. And we know that we can culture them through pre-implantation stages without any problem. So this is a very well-established method. But on the seventh day of development, we have to return those embryos to the mother to develop further. So, there were two questions which we wanted to address here. First, can we set up the system that will allow us to culture those human embryos beyond the blastocyst stage in vitro? And second, would embryo, human embryo be able to self-organize its life without the attachment to the body of the mother? So, what do we know about those embryos, um, human embryos developing at the time of implantation? So, Essentially, all of the information came from one single paper published quite a long time ago, in which 34 human embryos were analyzed, embryos developing in vivo, by EM. And when you look at these beautiful images, and now below I put images of the mouse embryo, which we recently obtained through equivalent stages of implantation development, you see that they are incredibly similar. But Two days later, these embryos look entirely different than mouse. So mouse forms those ex-cylindrical structure, elongated, folded, funny structure, and human embryo is this beautiful flattened disc. And in it, epiblast splits into two different compartments, so-called epiblast disc, which will generate the body, and the amniotic ectoderm. So this is another image of the same embryo. So the question is, could we mimic those hallmarks of human development outside mother's body. So this is the system that we develop, and I'm now speeding up a little bit. Um, so I will show you two movies uh, in which uh, you can see the first couple of days of development, human embryo goes through this contraction and finally attach to the substrate. And second, you see the development of those attached human embryos to the 13th development, 13th day of development, which is a limit in UK to which we can culture human embryos outside body of the mother. So what did we see? And I would like to show you on the next five slide, slides the major feature that we were able to observe thus far in those human embryos developing in vitro. So first, we concentrated on development of the lineages. And we found out that separation between epiblast and hypoblast that will give rise to placenta is not like in the mouse occurring before embryo implantation, but after embryo implantation. And you can see now the 9, 10 day of development where those two lineages are separated. We also look at the trophoectoderm lineage that will give rise to placenta. And we found out that in vitro, this lineage also is able to differentiate, as in vivo, into two different types of trophoblast cells. One which is multinucleated and further away from the developing embryo, and one in close association, uninucleated, in close association with the embryo proper. So when we found that we formed all three lineages at that stage, normally, we asked the question whether we can generate 
the specific cavity that happens in the first few days after implantation that is absolutely essential for the embryo to develop further, called a proamniotic cavity. And you'll be able to see here that on the 9th, 10th day of development, this cavity is formed absolutely normally and on time. So not only proamniotic cavity forms, we also find out the cavity of the yolk sac form. So we didn't have a good markers at the moment. Those markers do not exist and nobody really look at the human embryos developing in culture at this stage. So we do not have a good markers for amniotic ectoderm molecular markers. But if we segmented cells, membranes, to be able to identify how many population of cells we have, we see that we have those cells that will form the apiblast disc, the columnar, so those are the cells which will form the future body, and those flattened cells above, in close association with trophoectoderm, most likely are amniotic ectoderm. And finally, the third structure, the, final, the, the second cavity, and the final structure I would like to show you is the pro, uh, pro, um, uh, yolk sac cavity that is also set up in vitro. So uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to show you the final slide. It really summarizes uh, this uh, part, the third part of my talk, which I showed you that we can culture now human embryos for these few days beyond implantation outside the body of the mother. And this is incredibly powerful technique because that's the time when many, many abnormalities happen in our development. So this would allow us to see how exactly our cells decide their fate, establish specific structures, and how we can control this process to help it in the future. We also showed that human embryo have amazing self-organizing ability at this stage of development because it can progress through the specific developmental stages without being attached to the body of the mother. So I would like to come back to Klim just for a second to show you that I think that we now started to unveil all of those uh, events that lead mouse and human embryo to develop to the blastocyst stage, but we now go beyond that Klim didn't even predict. We can go beyond the blastocyst stage and find out how we develop until uh, embryo reaches the stage when it starts to set up the future head and the rest of the body. And finally, I would like to thank everybody in the lab uh, who really works. I'm just only uh, a spokesman uh, for the lab. I don't do my experiments anymore. And I am... Um, uh, highlighted in red those people who specifically contributed to the project I, I told you about today. And, um, and also would like to thank all our wonderful collaborators and funding bodies. And thank you very much for listening. So we have time for a couple of questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, Harvey. So we can mimic certain stages of development with human iPS cells and human ES cells. So we can start to make those structures, which are, um, we call them uh, rosette-like structures uh, that, that open up the lumen. They do not progress further in development because they need the signal from those extra embryonic tissues, which are normally surrounding epiblast cells uh, for them to break the symmetry and establish AP axis formation. So while we can mimic certain aspects of development with ES cells, not all of it, at least right now, is possible for using just ES cells and IPS cells. Question in the back. Magda, can you repeat the question? Yes, yeah, so this is the question about, we now know that uh, the stress on the mother, even at the stage of development where embryos are just at pre-implantation stages, so the first seven days and the next seven days when embryo implants, uh, show, uh, is now shown that it has a, a major effect on development of the embryo and whether we can look at that. And uh, absolutely we can, because we can now mimic those stressful situations um, uh, in vitro and actually directly look how it impacts not only self aid decisions, but developmental program that ensures that particular stages of development are achieved at particular time for implantation to be successful. So when it happens within the body of the mother, we do not have such an insight to what happens in the embryo. So it's only possible to do the proper study of those events outside in culture. Great, let's thank Magda again. Thank you.